Before the video, real quick, I'd like to share with you my latest addiction. And yes, this video was sponsored by Battle Camp, but let me tell you, I get approached by mobile game sponsor offers often enough to share two of them with you each video, so when I actually do show you one, it means I actually love it enough to play it daily. So what is Battle Camp? Combine monster catching and battling with puzzle elements and all in an adorable and epic MMORPG world. Play through the campaign story with its colorful characters and even take on other players in PvP. Go on dungeon raids in solo play or in a group of up to 24 players. Events are non-stop and bosses pop up all the time challenging both your monsters fighting abilities and your own puzzle strategy. There are 1200 monsters of all kinds for you to catch, feed, and train. And it's all free to download on Android, iOS, and Amazon. Links of course are in the description, check it out. The Tropical Isle Delfino, a sunshiny paradise full of fruits, fun, and for Mario, peril. Or was it? Was it perhaps all a lie? Super Mario Sunshine is a trip away from most of the formulaic Mario games. Not only taking Mario and the crew outside of the Mushroom Kingdom, but also introducing an entirely new way for Mario to platform his way around. The Flash Liquidizing Ultra Dousing Device, better known as Flood. Once Mario acquires the Flood, the princess is kidnapped and yet another adventure to rescue her begins. Right? Well, maybe not. You see, Mario Sunshine has a ton of clues in it that points to the distinct possibility that the events in the game never happened, and instead, the player is filming a TV show. Does this seem improbable to you? Well, let's just look at the evidence given to us. Just after arriving Isle Delfino's airport, Mario runs into Flood which just happens to be sitting out in the middle of the runway with no explanation ever given for it being there. This is extremely convenient for Mario, who uses it to clear the runway of the polluted piranha plant, only to be arrested and thrown into a kangaroo court trial. In the complaint against Mario, he is accused of pollution and vandalism using the game's ever-present paint-like goop which has suddenly appeared all over the island. It's mentioned that the island has been cloaked in an unnatural darkness ever since the island's many shine sprites disappeared or lost their power, which is supposedly due to the goopy vandalism. A sketch that looks vaguely like Mario is produced based on supposed eyewitnesses' testimony, and the judge throws the book at him, declaring that he cannot leave the aisle until the goop is gone. Now obviously, Mario games aren't known for their gritty realism, but a lot of things are way off about this trial. In the trial, Mario is given no lawyer, with only his companions to try and help prove his innocent. This doesn't matter, however, since when Princess Peach tries to speak up against an unproven accusation, she is immediately silenced by the judge. To think that a small island nation would so blatantly mistreat not only a well-known international hero, but also the royalty of a rather large and populous kingdom is just absurd. It's even more absurd to think that the princess would just brush off this extremely hostile behavior when Mario proves his innocence at the end of the game, acting as if nothing had ever happened. No, perhaps this trial is staged. Not against Mario, but rather as a means to introduce the story elements for a dramatic tale acted out by Mario and his companions. Treating a princess this way is almost bad enough to declare war, but if this were all acted out and staged, no big deal at all. This is all expected and planned out. There's plenty more evidence to go though, so let's just move on. In the jail scene after the trial, Flood informs Mario through some sort of data analysis that the Shine Sprites are Isle Delfino's source of power. Yet, throughout the entire rest of the game, not a single area shows any signs of electrical problems. The only Shine Sprite that really seems to do anything is the main one, and it just clears up some clouds. Then, after Mario gets released, a pair of Pianta officers informs Mario that they'll be watching him closely to ensure that he doesn't slack off. They then spend the rest of the game standing in front of a single building off in a small corner of Delfino Plaza. Those are either some really poor officers or fakes, actors hired to drive the story along. Shadow Mario's first appearance soon after in Delfino Plaza seems fine at first, but when you look at one detail in particular, it raises a lot of questions. Regardless of how long the player spends defeating Shadow Mario, Toadsworth, the princess's personal assistant, never moves to help and never even speaks up when he witnesses the attempted kidnapping. That's very strange for someone whose job it is to serve and to an extent protect royalty. That is, 
unless he's assured that there's no real danger because the chase is scripted out for a TV show. Now then, riddle me this. While pictures have served as portals in the Mario universe since Super Mario 64, why is sunshine the only time they're used to teleport Mario to elsewhere in a contained area? None of the levels in Super Mario 64 were actually connected to the castle. Instead, they were all their own self-contained areas. This is, at minimum, heavily implied to not be the case in Sunshine. Not only are all the areas stated by characters to be part of the same landmass, but many other levels can easily be spotted off in the distance as part of the aisle. But if this is all one island, why do most of the levels have a graffiti mark on a wall as their main entrance then? Purely for show. The level entrances were chosen for visual spectacle. That's why Mario shoots out of a cannon to enter Pina Park and stares up into the sun to enter Noki Bay, despite just simply walking there being 100% easier and possible. Entering most levels were treated to a mission select screen. In the North American and European versions of Sunshine, each mission is labeled as an episode and given a title. What an odd thing to call your missions unless they were literally episodes of a TV show, or at least trying to get that idea across. This trend carries over through all of the releases. In the Japanese version of Sunshine, each mission is a story. And side note, there's only one major instance of Nintendo labeling something as a story. Mario Story, the Japanese name for Paper Mario, a game whose events are widely speculated to be fictional in the Mushroom Kingdom universe's canon, as they take place entirely in storybook form. Fiction, even in the Mushroom Kingdom. Fiction within fiction, ooh. Finally now, we've reached the first level of the game, Bianco Hills. In episode 2, Mario first encounters a mini-boss named Petey Piranha. The first time Petey is defeated, he melts into a puddle of brown goop. It's really strange that he then reappears just fine in a later episode of the same level and upon defeat, melts into a puddle of brown goop again. I propose that while the fights may indeed be real, or at least acted out, the defeat is a special effect, stitched onto the end of each fight to make the perfect dramatic fight scene. Both fights taking place in Bianco Hills is no accident either. Since they're the first episodes recorded, they'd naturally be some of the earliest ones later put on TV. And nothing hooks people into watching like a good dramatic fight scene with awesome special effects in the first few episodes of a show. And really, they don't even need to be good special effects, I mean look at Doctor Who. The next the next level available to open is Rico Harbor. Episode 2 of Rico Harbor introduces us to a recurring situation in the game. Many individual Piantas have one or more Shine Sprites in their possession. This is particularly odd since the Shine Sprites were supposed to have fled. That is, gone away from the Shine Gate of their own volition. Why then would a large number of them be held by citizens of the Isle? And why wouldn't the citizens turn in a Shine Sprite they perhaps stumbled across, if they are in fact so important to the well-being of the entire island? No, the fact that a large number of Shine Sprites are held by individual Piantas only supports the point that the Shine Sprites are actually powerless and are there merely to make up a story element. At least, the smaller ones are. Level 3 is Gelato Beach. Here we have the first encounter with a mysterious character, Il Piantissimo, a human sprinter that challenges Mario to a race in three separate levels, while wearing a Pianta costume. The costume department got pretty lazy with him. Curiously, if the Pianta mask of Il Piantissimo's model is manually removed, the person underneath appears to be the running man from the Legend of Zelda series. Hiring someone who was constantly running himself, or comes from a long lineage of runners to race Mario, would make sense, considering that very few other people would even have the chance of running as fast as the hero plumber. Also, Link and Mario have crossed paths at times, so it is speculated that Hyrule is another continent, on the same planet as the Mushroom Kingdom. The last bit of evidence from the beach comes in episode 8, the Watermelon Festival. The watermelons in this episode are quite unusual. They're rather large and they don't act very much like watermelons at all. If Mario pushes a melon into a wall or off of too high of a cliff or allows a cataquack to throw the melon into the air, the watermelons pop. They don't get crushed or crumble. They pop. Like a balloon. In fact, the watermelons are balloons, as is demonstrated by their popping. 
the deflation of the largest melon when it is placed in the fruit grinder, and the inflation of a replacement melon for Mario when he pops the largest melon at its spawn point is absolutely solid evidence towards this fact. After Gelato Beach is Pina Park. Pina Park's first episode is perhaps the most blatant and obvious evidence for Sunshine being a TV show for several reasons. First, Mario chases Shadow Mario into the main part of the park, where Shadow Mario uses some sort of ability to float over water. And this ability is never shown again, and it's never shown before. The pool then opens up like a secret hatch, allowing a giant, Bowser-like robot to rise up from beneath. Mario is then encountered by... <laughs> by a literal director, who calls him a fearless hero and calls the battle a show, and sets Mario up with a hero's vehicle to fight Mecha Bowser. Even more bizarrely, once Mario defeats Mecha Bowser, the top of the robot opens up to reveal Peach inside. Since only Shadow Mario entered the robot at the beginning of the fight, that means Peach must have been inside while Mecha Bowser was still sitting below the pool. This entire battle is full of absurdities and odd coincidences that point to it just being staged. If it wasn't staged, then why was there a huge containment area for Mecha Bowser hidden in the middle of the amusement park? How does anyone sneak a humongous robot in there? And for context, a lot of Japanese TV shows are full of very strange and somewhat hilarious coincidences like this, especially ones aimed at children. Episode 2 contains our first encounter with another recurring mini-boss, a Monty Mole manning a cannon. Not just any Monty Mole, though, a single Monty Mole who shows up later in Noki Bay manning an identical cannon. Obviously, whoever is producing the show hired one actor for multiple similar roles. In all but two episodes of Pina Park, an unusual group of enemies known as the Electro Koopas are present. These Koopa-like enemies have a peculiar shell, with multiple spikes on it that constantly run electricity through the air. These are odd for two reasons. One, they never appear in a game outside of Sunshine, and two, Real-life animals that deliver electric shocks have to store up their charge, and thus can't be releasing electricity constantly. Even other electric animal enemies in Mario and Zelda have to recharge at some point. It seems reasonable, then, to conclude that Electro Koopas are, in fact, not alive. They are small, robotic enemies with a generator inside to produce constant electricity. Pina Park has a few other oddities to it as well, but those will be addressed in a bit when we look at the recurring events in all of the levels. Level 5, Serena Beach, perhaps the most atmospheric of the levels. There's not much of note outside the Hotel Delfino, but once inside, a number of oddities appear. In Episode 4, Mario enters the hotel's on-site casino and ground-pounds a random tile on the roulette wheel to descend into a boss fight with King Boo. To say that King Boo appearing in Hotel Delfino is random would be an understatement, but that's not even the part that makes the boss battle seem extremely staged. The manner in which Mario injures King Boo in that fight is a three-step process. First, he sprays the slot machine King Boo is sitting on, for some unknown reason. Then, once King Boo spits out fruits and ripe jalapeno peppers, Mario throws a pepper at King Boo and follows that up with a fruit. This fight... it's weird. It's, it's just weird. This fight raises a lot of questions. Why does a combination specifically of a spicy pepper and fruit damage a boo? Why is King Boo's ability to spontaneously produce enemies and objects tied to a slot machine? And most importantly, why is there a random stage area below the roulette wheel of a casino? Well, going from past logic, it's very likely that this King Boo is also fake. The only thing Mario is battling in this specially built stage underneath the casino is the slot machine. King Boo is some sort of projection or hologram, or perhaps just special effects added in later. When Mario hits the machine first with a pepper and then with any fruit, it adds a tick of damage to the fake King Boo. And when it hits three, King Boo disappears leaving a shine sprite. Next up, Noki Bay. Episode 1 we've already covered in the discussion of Pina Park, so let's go to Episode 2. Episode 2 features a mysterious tomb of an ancient Noki king, as claimed by the village elder. The elder brings up this tomb as a non sequitur in conversation with Mario about the pollution problem in the bay, and then directs Mario to how to find the tomb. The elder then encourages Mario to loot it as a reward. Not only does this mission make zero sense as a reward for anything, the idea that a village elder would direct an outsider, an outsider supposedly criminal no less, to raid an ancient preserved tomb, which is obviously important to the local culture, is positively bonkers! If it isn't scripted for a TV show. After Mario follows the hidden paths of the cliffs up to the area at the top, high above the tomb, he then encounters a mini-boss previously defeated in Rico Harbor, Gooper Blooper. Let me repeat that. Mario 
encounters a giant squid on top of a sheer cliff hundreds upon hundreds of feet above any substantial source of water. This implies that either Gooper Blooper isn't a real squid, or was very recently placed up there just for Mario to encounter. Either way, more staged drama. And even after all that, we're nowhere near done with Noki Bay. The next episode is somehow even stranger than the ones before. The village elder presents Mario with scuba gear that somehow perfectly fits over Mario and connects to Flood. He then explains that he believes the issue with the local pollution is on the ocean floor. He then tells Mario to jump into a bottle prepared specifically for Mario to practice deep sea diving. Yes, in a bottle perhaps one-sixth the size of Mario himself. Nevertheless, Mario immediately dives into the bottle, shrinking to a minuscule size as he does. Not only has Mario never had the ability to shrink on command prior to this game, this is an ability he never uses afterwards either, and no one mentions it. This mission is obviously set up beforehand with two stages of sorts, Noki Bay itself and a giant bottle made for Mario to swim around in. The visual link between them isn't Mario actually shrinking, it's just a special effect for the show being filmed. Noki Bay saves the strangest spectacle for last though with episode 4. In episode 4, the source of the pollution is finally discovered on the ocean floor, where the elder randomly guessed it'd be. The pollution is coming out of a hermaphroditic diprosopus giant eel. Hmm. Put more plainly, the creature appears to be a male eel and a female eel sharing a body fused at the mouth. The dirty plaque bacteria on this creature's teeth is making purple goop bubbles which rise to the surface of the bay and pop, spreading the pollutants all around the water. Now, there have admittedly been some extremely strange creatures featured in Mario games before, but this eel really takes the cake. Its own oddness combined with the idea that tooth plaque would be causing an entire bay to become polluted catapults this mission far above the line of absurdity into spectacle. The perfect thing for a TV show. Especially if it's a Japanese one. The game quiets down a bit in Pianta Village. Episode 1 features a group of Chain Chomplets, an immature form of the Chain Chomps, that, like many other enemies here, is never seen outside of Super Mario Sunshine. Bizarrely, when overheated, the Chain Chomplets seem to give off a burning hot version of the game's goop. Them having this ability conflicts with the general story of Sunshine quite a bit. How are the residents of Isle Delfino unprepared to deal with the goop if some of the animals already on the isle produce it naturally? Are we to assume that the Chomplets only for the first time ever started sweating goop just when Mario, the only one who was able to deal with it, showed up? That seems very unlikely to say the least. And with that, we've finished all of the evidence that applies to particular levels, but we still have even more to go through. Episode 7 of each level contains a Shadow Mario chase, many of which are unusual in and of themselves. In every Shadow Mario chase, not only does Shadow Mario go in circles, but he also waits for Mario to catch up to him if the player falls too far behind. Obviously, any real villain wouldn't be doing that. Beyond that, in Delfino Plaza, Bianco Hills, and Noki Bay, we see Shadow Mario comfortably swimming in water. This happens despite the fact that not only does the goop in the game dissolve and wash away in water, but Shadow Mario himself is hurt by being sprayed with water. Conflicting symbols! Shadow Mario reveals his true identity in the Mecha Bowser fight. He is in fact Bowser Jr. somehow disguising himself with the goop present in the game. The goop is supposedly coming from a magic giant paintbrush stamped with Professor Egad's trademark, same as the Flood. As if Egad gave both of these items to the populace. Or perhaps, just made the more advanced props for the show. The reason Bowser Jr. gives for kidnapping Peach is that he supposedly believes Peach to be his mother, after Bowser told him that. This is, well, admittedly silly, and should be obviously untrue even to a young Koopa like Bowser Jr. In fact it is, Bowser Jr. knows Peach isn't his mom as he states at the end of the game. So, what's his motivation again? Bowser Jr.'s motivation along with the ending scene of Bowser explaining that he lied to his son for reasons never given, and the plan to kidnap Peach make up another part of the script for this show's story arc. It's a bit of a plot hole, which aren't common in Mario games. Granted, that's in part due to Mario games not having much plot at all usually, but still, having a plot hole would make much more sense if it's related to a TV show being produced. A TV show with substantially more plot than Mario games tend to have. Now, you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned a minor character that appears in several levels at all yet, Yoshi. 
And there's a good reason for that. The characters we see and Mario uses to complete a number of missions are not actually Yoshis, exactly. The supposed Yoshis we see in Sunshine have a couple of abilities and a couple of peculiar problems that no other game's Yoshis have. Sunshine's Yoshis are able to squirt fruit juice out of some sort of internal pouch. They can change color when they eat fruit and spin very rapidly in the air with Mario. That last ability completely contrasts with the Mario Galaxy games, which brought back the spin jump for Mario, but only lets Yoshi either shake his head or cancel some temporary abilities with the spin. Yoshi does not like spinning, except for in Sunshine, the supposedly fake one. The Yoshis on Isle Delfino also show a number of odd problems that no other Yoshi has had before or since. In order to hatch, these Yoshis must eat a specific fruit through the shell of their egg. They also spontaneously liquefy and evaporate, in not one, but two separate situations. The first being if Yoshi goes into water that reaches too high up on its body, and second if the aforementioned internal juice pouch runs dry. While you could argue that the requirement of eating fruit to hatch and grow to adult form spontaneously just means that these Yoshis are a subspecies of T. Yoshisaurus Munchakupas, that still doesn't explain how a Yoshi could randomly evaporate Operate. It is this very unusual behavior that leads me to conclude that these Yoshis, like King Boo, Petey Piranha's death sequence, and the Electro Koopas, are all fake. Special effects. It may look like Yoshi and act somewhat like a Yoshi, but it's just a robot that can somehow dissolve. Or dissolves via special effects put in post. Of course, one of the other weird things that Sunshine has is its mysterious secret levels, locations completely cut off from the rest of Isle Delfino, accessible through portals, some of which have intuitive locations, but a few are just nonsensical. Let's look at the most egregious secret level entrance, episode 6 of Pina Park, the Yoshi Go Round's secret. In this episode, Mario retrieves Yoshi and has to feed it fruit until it becomes the correct color to complete a pattern of fake Yoshis on a merry-go-round. Once Yoshi is the correct color and touches the empty pole, Mario enters the secret level. There are very few things in Sunshine that make less sense than this level entrance. The other level entrances are mostly entered through caves, entrances to obscure buildings or holes in large objects. Though again, why would just some random doorway in a building take you to some mysterious other dimension? That does not seem like a very good place for a dimension like that. Kids could just walk into that door. These secret levels of sunshine are all made of a variety of structures, usually with a mix of moving and non-moving platforms, occasionally with a few enemies sprinkled in, and in one case with a number of piantas in it too. They all take place in gigantic voids, some of which even have backgrounds themed to Mario's previous adventures. Now aside from the question of how these levels are constructed or stay floating, one would have to wonder why these levels, which are supposedly in an island kingdom completely separate from the Mushroom Kingdom, would be themed after Mario's former feats. These levels are most easily explained as a combination of effects for the camera filmed in a rather large studio area with a rather large green screen behind it. Probably the same one where the giant bottle was built. And finally, after a mountain of evidence from all the levels of sunshine, we've reached the final boss fight. Mario jumps, hovers, and directs a lava-proof boat through the main room of Mount Corona's magma chamber. Or rather, through a studio built to look like a magma chamber. The fact that platforms, which obviously didn't form naturally, are in a pool of lava and aren't melting makes no sense otherwise. Mario then rockets up to what might be the mouth of the volcano. It's hard to tell since the final boss fight takes place in a void similar to the secret levels, meaning, again, a giant room with a giant green screen. Up above the magma chamber, Mario encounters Bowser, Bowser Jr., and Peach, all sitting in a goo-filled hot tub. Well, the Koopa royalty are, Peach is perched up on a rubber ducky, but I digress. The detail that most immediately stands out in the hot tub is Bowser himself, who appears to be multiple tens of times larger than Mario. While Bowser has grown to similar sizes in Galaxy games, that was with the space-time warping power granted by the Grand Stars. And in New Super Mario Bros, he grows to this size thanks to Kamek's magic. Here, Bowser only has the Shine Sprites, and the Shine Sprites show no evidence of having any other power aside from glowing slightly. Also, by this point, Mario should have most of the Shine Sprites. Once Mario lands on the hot tub and words are exchanged with the Koopas, the final fight begins. What is very odd about the final battle is that Mario never actually hits Bowser or Bowser Jr. 
either directly or indirectly. Instead, he uses Flood to launch up in the air and slam down on five protruding platforms attached to the hot tub, eventually upsetting its balance enough for it to just tip over and dumps Peach and the Koopas out, thus defeating Bowser. Despite Bowser never being hit, he's now shown to have shrunk to a much more normal size for him in the ending scene where he talks to Bowser Jr. about his lies. Though if he is supposedly directly above a volcano, he did get dumped into lava. Though, like in New Super Mario Bros., Big Bowser tends to be fine with that. Bowser being defeated without either being hit by something or dumped into lava and fully submerged in it was unprecedented for the Mario series. Actually, no. It wasn't. There was one other game in which Mario never hurts Bowser, but instead defeats him by allowing him to fall. Fall by stomping a hole through the floor. How interesting that the final boss battle of Sunshine so closely matches the battle in Super Mario Bros. 3. The only game we actually have direct confirmation of being 100% quite literally staged. Mario Bros. 3 is a stage play, in case you didn't know. Video about it here, it's absolutely true, Miyamoto confirmed it. So, there it is. The evidence that Mario Sunshine never happened, or rather, that it was a fictionalized show recorded by Mario, Peach, and the Koopa family. You might wonder why, though. And while these next ideas are unfounded in the evidence mentioned above, I think they're intuitive enough to be possible. For one, the game doesn't show off all of Isle Delfino but it does show all of its hot spots, areas that would attract tourists with their fun games and culture. It's possible then that the residents of the Isle collectively agreed to take part in this show for the major amount of attention the Isle would receive. After all, it was unknown before Mario Sunshine happened. So we have an explanation for why the Piantas participated in the show, but what about Mario, Peach, and the Royal Koopa family? Well, it is possible that they were paid to participate. However, considering that we've seen this exact combination of actors before in Super Mario Bros. 3, it might just be possible that Mario has started an entertainment production company to cash in on his fame and adventures. Still, that's a theory to look into for another time. There is also the possibility that Peach and or Toadsworth set this all up to help boost Mario's ego again after being kidnapped in Luigi's Mansion, the game right before this one. But again, that's just another theory. So, thanks for sticking with me through this very long look into Mario Sunshine. Here are a few other awesome Mario videos, and please consider supporting this channel through Patreon to keep it on going strong. And be sure to never stop using that noggin. up against an unproven accusation, she is immediately silenced by the judge. To think that a small island nation would so blatantly mistreat not only a well-known international hero, but also the royalty of a rather large and populous kingdom is just absurd. It's even more absurd to think that the princess would just brush off this extremely hostile behavior when Mario proves his innocence at the end of the game, acting as if nothing had ever happened. No, perhaps this trial is staged, not against Mario, but rather as a means to introduce the story elements for a dramatic tale acted out by Mario and his companions. Treating a princess this way is almost bad enough to declare war, but if this were all acted out and staged, no big deal at all. This is all expected and planned out. There's plenty more evidence to go though, so let's just move on. In the jail scene after the trial, Flood informs Mario through some sort of data analysis that the Shine Sprites are being there. This is extremely convenient for Mario, who uses it to clear the runway of the polluted piranha plant, only to be arrested and thrown into a kangaroo court trial. In the complaint against Mario, he is accused of pollution and vandalism using the game's ever-present paint-like goop which has suddenly appeared all over the island. It's mentioned that the island has been cloaked in an unnatural darkness ever since the island's many shine sprites disappeared or lost their power, which is supposedly due to the goopy vandalism. A sketch that looks vaguely like Mario is produced based on supposed eyewitnesses' testimony, and the judge throws the book at him, declaring that he cannot leave the aisle until the goop is gone. Now obviously, Mario games aren't known for their gritty realism, but a lot of things are way off about this trial. In the trial, Mario is given no lawyer, with only his companions to try and help prove his innocent. This doesn't matter, however, since when Princess Peach tries to speak- Perhaps all a lie? 
Super Mario Sunshine is a trip away from most of the formulaic Mario games, not only taking Mario and the crew outside of the Mushroom Kingdom, but also introducing an entirely new way for Mario to platform his way around. The Flash Liquidizing Ultra Dousing Device, better known as Flood. Once Mario acquires the Flood, the princess is kidnapped and yet another adventure to rescue her begins. Right? Well, maybe not. You see, Mario Sunshine has a ton of clues in it that points to the distinct possibility that the events in the game never happened, and instead, the player is filming a TV show. Does this seem improbable to you? Well, let's just look at the evidence given to us. Just after arriving Isle Delfino's airport, Mario runs into Flood which just happens to be sitting out in the middle of the runway with no explanation ever given for Isle Delfino's source of power. Yet, throughout the entire rest of the game, not a single area shows any signs of electrical problems. The only shine sprite that really seems to do anything is the main one, and it just clears up some clouds. Then, after Mario gets released, a pair of Pianta officers informs Mario that they'll be watching him closely to ensure that he doesn't slack off. They then spend the rest of the game standing in front of a single building off in a small corner of Delfino Plaza. Those are either some really poor officers or fakes, actors hired to drive the story along. Shadow Mario's first appearance soon after in Delfino Plaza seems fine at first, but when you look at one detail in particular it raises a lot of questions. Regardless of how long the player spends defeating Shadow Mario, Toadsworth, the princess's personal assistant, never moves to help, and never even speaks up when he witnesses the attempted kidnapping. That's very strange for someone whose job- Before the video, real quick, I'd like to share with you my latest addiction. And yes, this video was sponsored by Battle Camp, but let me tell you, I get approached by mobile game sponsor offers often enough to share two of them with you each video, so when I actually do show you one, it means I actually love it enough to play it daily. So what is Battle Camp? Combine monster catching and battling with puzzle elements and all in an adorable and epic MMORPG world. Play through the campaign story with its colorful characters and even take on other players in PvP. Go on dungeon raids in solo play or in a group of up to 24 players. Events are non-stop and bosses pop up all the time challenging both your monster's fighting abilities and your own puzzle strategy. There are 1200 monsters of all kinds for you to catch, feed, and train. And it's all free to download on Android, iOS, and Amazon. Links, of course, are in the description. Check it out. The Tropical Isle Delfino, a sunshiny paradise full of fruits, fun, and for Mario, peril. Or was it? Was it 